I'm John Wright, and I'd like to give a sh short presentation on the first epistle of Peter, especially focused down on chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. It's kind of like a conversation, trying to work with scholarship and the studies, and, and so what's going on with Peter, particularly as we focus down on this particular passage. I've decided that the, the best thing to sort of to title this as I go through Peter and, and read him and is Peter calls Christians to have fearless confidence in Christ amid suffering. The passage that we're focusing on, 1 Peter 3, 13 to 15, is here. Just just for we're all so so we're all on the same page. I'm gonna just sort of read it quickly. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated. But in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. So this this is kind of a capsule, I think, of really what's going on uh, throughout the whole letter. These people um, seem to be suffering unjustly. They, they, they have all this coming against them, and there's fears being built up about what's going to happen to them. And in the midst of this, they're to be faithful to Christ. And then in the midst of being faithful to Christ, they're to be a witness to Christ. So this is quite quite the passage, really. So, as I've said, we're, 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 it's about challenging Christians to overcome suffering with a fearless devotion to Christ. That's the kind of nutshell um, summary that I believe is going on there. So we'll again, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on Peter 3, 13 to 15. Uh, part of the reason for this is that today's world is full of fear and suffering. There's a lot going on in the world, and there's a lot of fear and a lot of nail-biting, if you want, and uh, this is really a way uh, to, to try to look at it and see how we can approach it in the midst of of today's world what was going on for them how did Peter deal with it for them and how does Peter deal with it and how does that come to us because it's to provide insight for preaching and teaching and study for us today because the scriptures speak to us in the midst of our setting as much as it spoke to them in their setting now from the beginning from the early church it was never really questioned that First Peter wrote First Peter. After all, it says that it's written by First Peter. However, as time has gone on, uh, that view has come to be challenged. So, did he write it? Well, the letter says so. Uh, the early church didn't question it, and it just seems to make good sense that he would have wrote it. On the other hand, uh, as people have pointed out, the Greek it seems to be a little bit too too sophisticated for a fisherman or for somebody in Peter's. Uh, place in society, that his style doesn't seem to be congruent with the style of Peter in Acts, and a, and a whole number of other reasons in terms of uh, who's causing the suffering, where's the source of suffering, is it formal or informal, that kind of thing. So that's that's the kind of the ferment that this is going into. And so um, Actmeyer uh, points out that it's a really difficult problem. Let's just put it that way. It's it's interrelated. There's all kinds of things going on. So, who wrote it? Did First Peter write? Did Peter write Peter, or did somebody else write Peter? That's that's the question. And the, the importance of this question is also related to when did Peter write this, or when was it written? If it wasn't Peter, if he if he wrote it, it was in the the sort of past the midsection of the first century, maybe around 60, something like that. Uh, if Peter did not write it, uh, then maybe very late in the first century, 70, 80, maybe even up towards the, se the second century, because if, if it's written by somebody else, then it doesn't have to be written with his, within his own lifetime. So the date, the date and authorship are kind of tied together. Uh, what kind of suffering was it official or not? That's that's the kind of thing, because Nero Nero was sort of the first one. So if it was Nero, it it could be 64, 65, but you know, that's that's kind of hard to tell. So where should we come down? Well, I've looked at it, and for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to assume that the letter was written by Peter himself. There is 
no reason to assume otherwise. Well, the debate goes on. There's all kinds of arguments and counter arguments. I couldn't find anything really compelling to abandon the idea that Peter wrote it. There's good reasons why the Greek might be as it is, even within the letter itself. So I think it's easiest and simplest simply to recognize that Peter wrote it and that it, it doesn't matter, like the source of the suffering, whether it was formal or informal, the fact of the matter is they were suffering and Peter addresses their suffering, whether it's from the local communities or whether it's more official from the government. The other thing which is kind of interesting is that uh, this is one of the earliest testimonies we have of persecution against Christians uh, in Asia Minor. So that's that's kind of something to keep in mind. It's the reality that Christians have been persecuted for their faith uh, pretty much since the beginning, which is, you know, just the way it is. Now, who did Peter write to? Who was he writing to? Well, he tells us in the introduction he's writing to people in Asia Minor. He names some places and that's kind of where it is. He calls them exiles of the dispersion. Uh, so let, let's just, just mention it here. It says he's written by Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Berthenia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, for sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So they're chosen by God, they're sanctified by the Holy Spirit, so he's encouraging them, he's addressing them, and he's encouraging them as to who they are as the people of God. So there are a wide range of people over a large area, this is quite a large area. They're Greek or Jew by background, that's who the people were. Um, they were they were Greek or Jew who had come to a faith in Christ, and and because of that, one could make a the point that they would be strangers amidst a wider community, whether or not they were Jew or Greek. Because if you were Greek and this had been your culture, you were now Christian and you had taken on a different worldview, a different way of thinking. And if you were Jewish, your Jewish community would be looking at you askance because you'd taken on Christ as the Messiah and Savior. And that would have caused a lot of problems. <laughs> so this group of people are suffering from, from the surrounding culture in which they live. And it seems to me, as we look about in the world today, it's not hard to find examples of Christians today who find themselves strangers in the wider community. As I would say here, strangers in a pagan land, which I think is really all too true. And to make this point that, that as you take this group of people and they separate themselves from the surrounding community, from the temples and the community festivals, it's going to cause suspicion, it's going to cause tension, it's going to cause uh, suffering and, and uh, prejudice and all that kind of stuff. It's just the way human beings tend to be and that's the kind of situation in which they find themselves. And I think maybe a situation we find ourselves in as well. So as I've said, that there are people, uh, Peter's addressing this group of people, they're persecuted, uh, their faith marks them apart, and they suffer for that faith. And I'd like to, to point out that this is true, as I've said, for today as for then, even in my own situation where I'm living now, uh, Christian pastors have been uh, put in jail for saying things that are something that the, the culture doesn't want. And the culture reacts in fear to, to what these pastors are doing and trying to be faithful to Christ. So it's not it's not a distant thing. It's 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 they were persecuted and in very real ways we are persecuted for being faithful to Jesus Christ. And the letter itself, as you read through it, is stand firm in Christ, suffer for Christ, and witness to Christ. That's really how Peter is coming down because of the hope that we have in Christ. So how is the letter laid out? Well, the structure would be the logical flow and then the format is what kind of writing, letter, essay, note, and such. So reality is it's a, it's structured like a letter. That's it, or so it's formatted as a letter. That's that's a point that, that Bateman makes in his book, Interpreting the General Letters. He goes into a lot of detail about the different parts of a letter and different kinds of letter, but it's fairly clear 
Peter is a letter. But then, of course, okay, so that's that's how he structured it, which is understandable. But how is it f formatted? Now, that's the whole different matter. It's something that the, the scholars have been kind of at odds about. Nobody seems to be able to come up with the, a definitive structure, A, B, C, D, this is this, and this is that, or anything like that. It's all very uh, convoluted. Uh, different kinds of outlines are provided by different kinds of people. And as, as uh, we have Keener puts uh, towards the end of this quote here, Peter's exhortations are too tightly interrelated throughout the letter to be graphed in a single manner. And as you read through it, you'll find that th these re these themes kind of come back on themselves over and over again. He seems to, to, to just sort of rotate around through them. So he repeats his themes. Uh, I think there is a structure, uh, but it's not one that, that would be familiar to sort of modern readers in the Western world, not an ABC sort of linear structure. It's more convoluted than that, more connected than that. So the the book itself, the the letter itself, has a number of well different themes that Peter kind of brings up and brings out, and then and then moves on to something else and interrelates them together: suffering, uh, witness, faithfulness, hope, and a number of others. But those four: suffering, witness, and faithfulness, hope, are the are the ones that really kind of struck me as you go through it and relate to the passage that I'd like to focus on. So that Christians are to live differently, suffering for the sake of the gospel, so that they may both be a witness to the gospel and retain their their entry, if you will, in, into heaven, into the into the place of God. And that they do that because of the hope that they have in Christ. So they they suffer, they witness, they're faithful, and they have hope in the resurrection of this Christ. So here we are, hope. Initially comes right, right at the very beginning of the letter in, 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 in verse 3. They are to live holy lives. They're not to follow it to the ways of the world. And, and, and because of the temptations that are all around um, them and us to fall into the ways of the world. So they're to stand firm in adversity. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. There is this constant theme that the word of God, the, this, this Jesus, this um, reality, is forever it's not it's eternal it doesn't pass away it's not a passing fad we're grounded in christ we're grounded in the word we're grounded like a stone so kind of gone through that little bit there what's as we come up to chapter 3 verses 13 to 15 what what do we see going on there well verse 13 is a kind of uh rhetorical uh question you know who who would who would persecute you if you're doing good kind of thing. Uh, but then it goes on to, but if but if they if they do hurt you, stand in firm stand firm in Christ and do not fear what they fear or do not fear them. So this sense of standing firm and suffering uh, for unjustly really and then as you go through this process that you are to be prepared to give a defense, to to stand firm in your faith to give a defense, and the defense, as we'll discover, is 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 the holy life that you are to live. So in verse 14, it says, even if you suffer, you are blessed. And then it goes on to, do not fear what they fear, or do not fear them. So, I like to go back, do not suffer, even if you suffer, you are blessed. That's an interesting word. That the sense of having already received the blessing, so you 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 already have it, and do not fear what they fear, do not fear them. That's that's a hard one. Uh, Reisenberg, or Reisberg, uh, sort of puts it out here. That it's, it's how do you translate it? Is it the the objective or the subjective? Um, one would mean do not fear them. And subjective would mean do not fear what they fear. So there's two different ways of, of translating this. There is a difference. But we'll get into that. First of all, do not fear them, uh, which seems to make more sense, certainly to us, like 
like all these bad things are happening. They're causing you to suffer. Do not fear them. Stand firm in Christ. And then be prepared to mount a defense, to defend your faith. And again, if you if if this is so, you are blessed. Makari, a, a quality of spirituality that is already present, which uh, Dr. Bailey uh, brings out in his book, Jesus from Middle Eastern Eyes. T to me, it's it's really kind of important that that to be blessed. What Peter is saying is, you have the state right now of being blessed. That 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 hope that you have in Christ, the reality that you have in this Jesus, is yours now. The blessing isn't something for future. Uh, it's not a blessing to come to you, but it is something that you hold in your heart at this moment. You are blessed. You are in a spiritual state of being blessed or of blessing. So that's. I think that's really important important that that comes through to, that give you the strength to stand firm in your faith i think that's really what peter's saying to, to know this is yours now and then uh the other way of looking at it is do not fear what they fear now i will get into that more detail later but it's 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 similar and there's some aspects that are the same but there's some aspects i think to translating it that way that have uh, meaning uh, for us today in the midst of the, the world that we live in as well. One of the things that strikes you as you read through it, which is really kind of why I picked the passage in the first place, was this idea of do not fear what they fear, which immediately brought to my mind Isaiah, because I know I'd read it, but and here I put the passage, but at verse 13, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. That, that put your, to not fear the world. And then it begins in verse 12, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what it fears or be in dread. Do not fear what the world fears. Do not fear what's going around you, uh, but, or be in dread of it, but trust the Lord and fear him own. Fear him only. This is, this is, uh, really an important theme that that peter you know this peter isn't just sort of pulling things out of the air he's dragging things forward from the hebrew scriptures he's saying look this is something that we as a pe people of god have always had to deal with and we're always having to remind ourselves that we belong to god and it is to if we're going to fear anything it's god that we fear not the world not what the world fears but God, and that will keep us grounded so that God will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against. That, I think, is really critical as we move forward. And well, and to put that passage into, maybe I should have said this first, but to put that passage into a bit of a context, uh, there's been an invasion. Uh, King, Hayes, King Ahaz does not follow uh, Isaiah's advice that, you know, trust the Lord, don't worry about what's going on, don't worry about all the, the wars that are going on, the people that are invading, just stand, don't, just trust God. And uh, he's being sort of pressured to, to make an allegiance with uh, Israel, and he doesn't really want to do that. And so what he does is he goes and makes an allegiance with Egypt. Well, that wasn't I'm not supposed to do that either. So, like, like, because he's trying to find strength, not in God, but in some kind of um, allegiance with some other foreign power, and that's just not on. You know, therefore, just as I put here, just as those of old were called to trust in the Lord, so Christians have the same hope now in Christ. And this is what I think Peter is getting at here. Yeah, things are going bad. You can see that that's what's going on out there, but don't run around. Just take a deep breath and trust in Christ, trust in God, because He's. we've been here before, guys. God's got us through it. He'll do it again. So we're not to be overcome by fear, but rather to know that, that God is there for us and that he has our back. He's always had our back, and he has our back now. And to also recognize that this behavior that we have is is has consequences 
it's the consequences in terms of who we are and our life going forward that if we trust God then we will have life you know the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry so that that's really important it's it's um I think Peter goes on about to, to be holy in order that God would hear our prayers this is really an important kind of inflection to trust God and to walk with him and then we will know his righteousness in our lives but if we capitulate and run after other gods other idols um, there's going to be a problem and this in fact in a very fundamental way has been the way it is since the beginning from the fall of humanity until now God has called his people to do good for the Lord over against those who do evil. It's riddled through the whole of the Hebrew scriptures and, and even through the New Testament. We're called to, to exemplify who we are in Christ. As Paul says, become what you are, that is, bearers of Christ in our lives. And Peter is working at building these people up and to know this and to walk in it in the midst of all of this struggle and chaos that they find going on around them. Then, and moving on to verse 15, if we're, it's not just about us. It's about being a witness to Christ. It's about rescuing people from the mire of the world around them and bringing them out of fear into solidarity with Jesus Christ, with bringing them out of the, the chaos of the world and what's going on in the world and to know the security of being in God in Christ Jesus. And the best way to do that to give a defense for our faith is to live holy lives. It's not just arguing with our words, not just giving, you know, I speak elegantly, as, as Paul talks about, but rather to be a people who, who by our lives, as well as by our voice, exemplify uh, our faith, and, and that defends our faith. And that is to be holy. And that's why I, Wisdom 6.10 for they will be made holy who observe holy things and holiness. And those who have been taught them will find a defense. That defense is in holiness, in, in not panicking and in trusting God. It's just really important is why I put this here. It's like to defend the faith is not just some argument, but it's a holy way of life. It's trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's trusting in God. Because it seems to me the, the word faith, pistos, is, is really rooted in the idea of trust. And it seems to me, as we look through this, to be in fear is to lack trust in the one who saves you. So what's, what sort of, what do I see here? It's, it's, so regardless of geography and time, it, it seems to me that this letter is universally addressed to all people who are sojourners scattered around the world, to all Christians who are not just in Asia Minor, but we all feel, I think, like sojourners. Uh, we feel like we're not at home. We're, we're like they were in a very fundamentally way. At that time, Christians did not public, participate in public events as all or most public events were religious and pagan in nature. And by this, um, you go back to even Paul and Corinthians. What does Paul talk about? He talked about, about that whole thing about not eating meat uh, offered to idols. And what was that about? That was like because of the, the ceremonies and the festivals that, that went on in Paul's day and the times of the New Testament were all religious in nature. There wasn't like places where animals were butchered like we have rather they were butchered in temples as a sacrifice to the gods and and so the whole nature of life was much more religious than we have today the result of that of course is that christians were not just anti-social we're not going to participate in your social gathering but but we're anti-religious we're not going to participate in your religious activities because we don't worship idols and the surrounding culture would see you not only just as different, but you would be insulting both them as the worshippers and the gods that they worshipped. And out of that would also fall the, the, the normal kind of human 
dislike for people who are different in some ways, but also the fear of God's wrath, that the wrath of the gods that might come upon the worshipers because uh, the Christians weren't paying attention to the to the to their gods. And then to to reflect on how does this manifest in today's world. The pagan world of today, I think, has many gods. And the failure to follow the dictates of the world today results in persecution and suffering. That's just, the narrative is out there. And we're called to follow that narrative. And so what are the gods of the world today? What drives people to persecute others? Well, unreasoning fear drives people to persecute others. That's really, that's really, but people get so scared that they do terrible things. And the scriptures, and Peter here is saying, do not be afraid, do not fear, but rather trust in the Lord, and 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 that will give you freedom. But today we have all sorts of things to fear, whether it's climate change, overpopulation, disease, or more. These are external forces that that we're told we ought to fear. And to me, they look a whole lot like small g gods you know there's some external power that that we have to bow down to and and worship by doing what they tell us by obedience and it doesn't look a whole lot different from obedience to idols you can make an argument about that but to me as i wrestle with with peter and what he's saying that it really comes out to me that 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 we are to have an inner peace of christ and not be kicked about by the fear of the world not to fear what they fear and not to be caught up in climate change or overpopulation or disease or all this stuff um, that's out there, but rather to be obedient to Christ and not to the world. So do not fear what they fear and do not fear them. That's, I think, at the heart of what's going on. So it's, the reality is, is, it's not just do not fear them, do not fear what they fear, I think it's both and. Do not fear what they fear, and do not fear them. Do not fear what they're going to do to you. But because we live in a world that wants us to be fearful of what the world is fearful of, so so we're to recognize in the integrity of our being and in the integrity of our hearts that that we have the peace of God, the peace of Christ, and that we receive that blessing because we are blessed in the moment. Not in the future. We are blessed in the moment. So as Christians, we may suffer, but our suffering is for Christ. And we are blessed in the midst of our suffering. And we are to live a holy life. That our holy life, that as we suffer in our life, but do not sin, becomes a witness to the eternal word that is Christ. And that is a defense that is saying this is real this is this is what we're all called to be and it's very much consistent with all of scriptures do not fear for i am with you says the lord do not be afraid for i am your god i will strengthen you i will help you i will uphold you with my victorious right hand that's kind of the nucleus of of what peter is going at because he's talking to people who are struggling and he's saying to them, do not fear them, do not fear what they fear, rather hang on to Christ and in your in the and, and be a holy people, and in the being a holy people, be a defense of the gospel. Call others to the freedom of Christ. So Peter is a relatively short letter by standards of some of the writings in the New Testament. And it's a complex letter, calling Christians to community, to live faithful lives, to be free of fear in the midst of, of a world that is hostile. And in doing that, they are to honor Christ and witness him to the world, to be a defense of him in the world. To recognize that we are, yes, sojourners, and that we are scattered about the world, but we're scattered about the world to be uh, a defense of Christ and a witness to Christ. We are strangers living in exile. And what people fear, that's lots of fear going around us, whether it be gods or some other false destructive power, we are not to be taken in by the fear of the world, by their fear, by what they fear. 
but rather we are to stand in Christ and to not fear but live a life worthy of our calling, worthy, a uh, life worthy and of, full of holiness. That in that reality, we witness to the risen Christ and we bring others into the faith of Christ. I think that's Peter's coming at them to comfort them because he is actually a pastor. <laughs> And he, he's really saying, hey, it's okay. Know that Jesus is Lord, that he's eternal, that you just stand in there and we'll make it through together. So Christians are blessed and are to live out that blessing in all that they say and do. And really, maybe it's just an expression of the Beatitudes particularly in Matthew 5, this beatitude here. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Stand firm. Do not fear what they fear. Live holy lives and be a witness to this Christ who brings life to the world.